So I'd already started disassembling this um, by the point that I decided I was going to make a video about it. Um, this is my kid's Power Wheels battery pack. So it was assembled. Let me get this together. I'm using this tripod is right in front of me, so it's a little weird. Um, but I wanted to have both hands for this because it's a little heavier. So the way this is assembled is like this, and there's the handle on top, right? To disassemble the battery pack, unlike the APC battery packs for UPSs that are all glued together, this has this little, almost like an automotive expander thingy in it. You just unscrew it and it pops out. It's a little anchor, basically. So unscrew it most of the way, pull out the plastic, and then the battery lifts off the uh, little plastic case here. I'm just going to take all this plastic junk and move it off to the side out of the way. And that's not really frustrating. You know, you look at that, you're like, man, that's really repairable. That makes a lot of sense. Really good design. I love it. Because obviously it's going to break. And I was like, cool, let's just undo this like we do battery packs in computers. And then I look at this and I'm like, surely, no, they did not solder that on. And then I just cut it with my knife and I was like, oh yeah, no, they definitely soldered that end on. So I'm going to get the gun, the soldering gun, because we're going to need quite a bit of heat for this terminal. And I'm going to pull that puppy off. Um, I'm going to see if I can just reuse this, but not to get the... Oh no, I'm trying to decide if I'm going to do soldering gun and unsolder, if I'm just going to cut the end off and just say it's done. But it looks like it's loose enough I can do that. I just need to get a pair of pliers, I guess, and try to pull off this heat shrink tubing that is going to be really gross to breathe if the soldering gun is going to melt it. So um, basically get all this junk off, and then, yeah, that'll work. Get the soldering gun in here. I... I'm generally surprised, although I, I bet why the reason they do this is because they don't want vibration to knock terminals loose and cause a fire hazard, considering it's for kids. So that might be the reason they've soldered this in place. I would argue there's probably better terminals and better batteries they could use, um, but probably one of those abundance of caution type things. So there's one. Um, we'll go ahead and slice this other one real quick. Let me get my knife. And uh, we'll slice that off as well. And then uh, get to town here. Yeah, the Kershaw needs to be sharpened. It's gotten pretty dull at this point. Put that back in my pocket. All right, let's take this guy right here. By the way, I, I don't know if it's a regional thing or part of the country I'm in in the U.S. Everyone carries a knife. That's a knife I carry on me everywhere I'm at. I mean, sand's going through an airport TSA, right? But Generally, if I'm traveling anywhere, I, I've always got my knife on me. So, I just assume that's a normal thing. I don't know if other parts of the country or other parts of the world, that would be crazy. Um, I mean, not like I'm traveling with my firearm everywhere, but I definitely travel with my knife always. Never know when you need a knife. You know, never know when you need to replace a battery. You know, I also see some, now that we got that off there, um, you do see a little bit of corrosion on this terminal, and it's buddy right here. So... I guess before I get too much further, you're going to ask what kind of battery we're we replacing, right? So right here on the side, 12 volt, 10 amp hour. Um, so going on the illustrious Amazons, we find a nice, random, wheezy, wheezy, wheezy 12 amp, 12 amp hour. I got an extra two amp hours in there. So I'm going to um, charge this thing up using my DC power supply. Uh, lead acid batteries are easy to charge. You basically just apply voltage to them and they'll take current, how they can take current. And to be gentle, I'll limit the current I'm putting into it. Um, so let me go ahead and get the gun out and we'll resume shooting once I get the gun. It's been a very long time since I've had to pull the uh, ye olden Radio Shack soldering iron gun out of the uh, mothballs. So we're going to see, I'm going to turn on the fume extractor here. And we're going to apply some heat to this terminal. Uh, 230 watts to be exact, and then we're going to pull this guy off if we can. Let's see what we can get going here. So I'm not making a very good electrical union right here, I don't think, or a very good thermal union. Come on, we need to get good and hot. There we go, we're starting to bubble. Terminal broke. <laughs> Freaking terminal so corroded. Oh, that was hot. Threw some solder at my hand there. I am wearing uh, safety spectacles, by the way. That is, uh, I guess we won't be trying to extract the other terminal because that is uh, not useful. Whew. That, uh, that'll make you jump. 
That's <sighs> why you wear safety glasses when you do things like this. All right. I'll do the other side. Maybe we'll get luckier, and the uh, terminal won't be as corroded. Let's see here. All right. Oh, there's a push tab. <laughs> they soldered push tab terminals. That's my fault. I, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. Okay, hold on. There's a push tab terminal. Let's. I'm gonna show you what I mean here. So see, let's move this fume extractor out of the way for the camera. All right. See this little button right here? I should have looked. Um, that needs to be depressed, but of course it's covered in solder now, so that's going to be entertaining. So let's give it a squeeze with the Heiko pliers here. And I'm going to heat it with the gun. We're going to see if we can make it move. Busted the terminal again. So either the terminal's corroded or uh, that ain't just ain't gonna happen. So, all right. And uh, yeah, so I don't know if I'd recommend this particular procedure. I probably should have just cut the leads off. Um, there's even a chunk of hot solder cut through in there. So uh, definitely be wearing your safety spectacles if you're gonna do this. Um, let me go ahead and put some coat on this thing real quick before I put it away. Yeah, just get a little bit of solder on the end of this. I want it to be got some clean solder on it before I store it because I don't use it very often. Glob it on there. There we go. Yeah. All right. Well, so much for that. Um, so the bat battery has been removed. We'll have to be redoing those terminals next. I smoke like a sieve. I'm gonna fire this thing up a little higher. Thing. Catch all that while it's out gassing. All right, so battery is obviously toasty. Um, those terminals are ruined and garbage. So what we're gonna do? We're gonna go ahead and take that uh, that battery. We're gonna cut those terminals off, and we're gonna put some new clean terminals on. So I had to go out and grab my trusty Kleins and two terminal ends. Um, normally I don't keep. <laughs> wire gauge stuff this large by the bench and I haven't these are from an old set of farm supply parts I've had forever um, they were in a bucket so look at the corrosion on that and enjoy um, either way what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and strip these leads down and crimp them so let me pull this back here real second and don't even hold it and stare at it through the camera while I do it So if you've never been told before, you never want to do too small of a gauge on your strippers. You always want to be precise on what the wire gauge is because you don't want to give your conductors a trim. So after you've got done stripping leads, they should be matching the diameter right, of the plastic. You don't want to have extra conductors that have been chopped off by your, your strip down. This is about as far as you want to, for a crimp job, about this far. And the other thing you're going to look for if you've never crimped a terminal before is see the split in the metal right so when we apply our crimp you're gonna see you have a non-insulated and insulated insulated only so depending on the type you'll have um, your pliers will give you instructions on which one to use so if we're not insulated insulated and we're talking 12 gauge here so it'll be up here I'll put this in here and I want the nub to face the split like that I'm gonna squeeze down and it's gonna fold in both of those on my conductor now, since I already have the big, beefy, awesome gun out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-tin the leads with some uh, 6040 solder, circa Radio Shack. Not my nice, yeah. I use keister wire for the uh, electronics projects, but when it comes to stuff like this, I have an old roll of... Uh, <laughs> Radio Shack Rosin Core. Uh, so we'll go ahead and turn on our fume extractor real quick. So I don't feel like breathing this. 
put it down here, and we're going to get our gun. Simply because I want to go fast like Sonic the Hedgehog. We are going to... Yes, I am touching the solder to the tip of the iron, and I'll tell you the reason why. The tip of this iron is not going to conduct heat very well. Oh, and my fume extractor is not running high enough. There we go. I need the something to help conduct the heat to the material I'm trying to solder. So a little bit of solder to get us started on the tip of the gun. We'll then touch. Now I can drop solder on the wire. There we go. Okay, next conductor. Move this guy up here. Get him out of the way. Oh, and I've split a lead out. Hold on. Once you got heat conducting into the joint, you can uh, drop it there. I'm going to light it last time for storage. I'm going to put a little bit of solder on this and let it set. There we go. Find my tips last a little longer, even if it's wasteful. I'm going to do a bump here and I'll drop it in the cab. There we go. Just pick it up with pliers once it cools down. So, there you go. It's a lazy way of tending two leads. So, we'll go ahead and crimp those next. We'll set Mr. Iron to the side. Since he's done smoking. Alright. It's a nice thing you drop solder anywhere like this. You can just give it a poke. It'll come right up. Like That's going to burn my mat. Poop. Well, that's a permanent fixture of my ESD mat now. Dang. There we go. So, I've got some other globs down here that are out of frame as well. That'll just be permanently part of the ESD mat. Well, it's conductive, so whatever. All right. Um, there's a reason I've got a nice, pretty gray mat for disassembly, and this is the dirty mat I use for soldering. So, doing larger stuff like this is a little messy anyway. Whatever. All right, so push this guy through. All right. And then I need to tell it to focus on here. Sorry. There we go. All right, so if you look right here, you see the conductor, and I'm going to push it where it's right about there. And if you look what I'm doing here, so the barrel, the extruded larger side is just plastic. The smaller diameter part is where the conductor is going to sit. So if you look what we're going to do, we're going to push to where the conductor is barely poking out the end there. And that's going to get us good coverage where all the metal is in contact. What we don't want is we don't want the jacket in the back. So once we get that in place, I'm going to take my... Clines, and we're going to place it in the appropriate gauge slot. So in this case, it's going to be 12 gauge, and I'm not good at doing this on camera, right? And like I said, we're going to rotate that so it's. Ooh, hold on, let me fix focus. There we go. All right. So right where that's right at 12 o'clock with that split. See the split on camera there? I get that right there. I like to go in a little bit so we can get some meat, and then get this guy just right, and then we're going to squeeze really hard really hard. Alright. <clears throat> Alright. So now, that's not going anywhere. So we've deformed the lead and that solder, right? And we've we've pushed that mechan it's a mechanical crimp now. We've pushed those ends in where they're smashing into that wire. And if you look, it's right about in the middle. So let's hold up an unused crimp. Right, so you want it to be in the middle of the crimp body. In a larger body, you might have multiple crimp points, but in this one is enough, with, especially with it soldered. And if you look, I'm gonna pull on that with all my strength, and that's not going anywhere. So if you can pull it off, you did you did wrong. Do it again. Uh, same thing. We're gonna get this guy on here. We're gonna check it's the right length. Right, get that inserted just so, and then I'm gonna get my, my crimpers, and we're gonna set it again to the Ooh, you get all flipped around here on camera. There we go. 
Get that set just so. We're about 12 o'clock again with that split. I move in a little further. Uh, let's fix that again. There we go. Right? So let me look at my eyes because I have no depth perception on the camera. I'm staring through the camera as I'm doing this. That is harder than you'd think. Pull that back a bit. There you go. And we're going to squeeze. And then we're going to provide extra power here. Really torque it in there. <clears throat> Alright. Yeah, she should be set and golden. Yeah, there you go. It's a good crimp. It's not going anywhere. Okay, so those those ends we already know fit on the battery. Let me, my solder chunks out of here. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a kid's toy. I'm not going for pretty here. You're catching me making one of the laziest videos possible. I mean, as if my production value is high on anything else I'm doing. All right. Now, let's talk about this guy. Let's see if he's got a charge, shall we? Get out the old Fluke 115. Set it to volts DC. And I'm going to give you a quiz. What is a fully charged 12 volt battery voltage of the AGM variety? If you said 12, you're wrong. Okay. Not bad. Still a little low. So we're going to give him some juice. Just a wee bit. I'm going to check my chart because I don't know that 12.76 is entirely low. So, one second. I'm going to look at a battery charge chart real quick. Well, apparently fully charged is right about 12.8. So yeah, so that's fully charged. So you can, you can, okay, it's not going to, not going to work 100% of the time. If you have a bad cell or something, it could be saying 12.8 volts, but there's no current capacity, so it's going to die instantly. This is a brand new battery. So if I'm checking it, I can rely on the voltage to tell me the present state of charge. And uh, tables on the interwebs tell me that a 12 volt AGM uh, fully charged is about 12.8 volts, which is just, what, 12.76, what I said earlier? I've already forgotten. It doesn't matter. 12 and a 7. Um, so she's good enough to run. We're going to go ahead and reassemble the battery pack with this now. So I'm going to move the fume extractor on back and out of the way here. We're going to take the plastic wonderful child safe. It's a kind of a pretty blue. I wish battery backup batteries came in this nice little case here. And then there we go. All right. Oh, and I should mention, uh, if you do this, please don't put your lead battery in the trash. Um, there are appropriate waste recycling, recycling centers, and a lot of automotive stores might even take it for you. Just don't don't put it in the garbage. It's not good for the environment. I'm not going to solder these because I'm not a Neanderthal. They're mechanically tight enough, yeah, so I'm not worried about them being a problem. Ah, I'm going to shove down there. There we go. Get this guy right in here. And then this. Oh, how interesting. Oh, yeah, that would help. Hold on. I need to rotate this around because that's going to be tight. They didn't leave me a lot of room on that lead. We're going to have to see. All right. Can I still? Oh, man. You dogs. All right. Let's see what we can do here. Oh, I see. Okay, there was a path underneath this. You see there's a cut where the... Oh, sorry. There's a cut on the plastic here where the positive lead goes under. That's why it's cut out. I see now. So that it's going to lay right on top of the positive lead. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. We're going to set this guy on top like that. And get the twizzle sticks. I don't want to call them. They're basically wall anchors, sheetrock anchors, what they look like. I'm going to put the twizzle stick through and try to get it through this little side piece of plastic and the handle. Get a little twist here. There we go. Okay, that's locked in. Let's get the other side. All right, so this little guy needs to go up and down. Line the holes up. Twist that guy in there like so. Right on. That's pretty groovy. Let's grab our handy dandy screwdriver here. I've had this screwdriver since this particular one. It's not a Klein, not anything fancy. And I happen to have had this screwdriver since about 2003. And uh, look at the tip. Yep. Pretty proud of how I haven't destroyed that one. I use this one for assembling computers. I did entire computer labs with this one screwdriver. I'm kind of fond of it. That was a fun thing back when you used to... You could commercially build computers and make a profit before 
companies like Dell and HP and IBM, I'm sorry, Lenovo, sucked every bit of profit out of desktop manufacture. And people started doing lease programs on computers for the office. That's right, your, uh, your computer you use at work might very well be leased, not even owned by the company you work for. So this janky thing is uh, reassembled now. Boy, that's wonk. But that's the battery pack. We're going to go ahead and plug this back up and see how it runs. This is the Mini Mouse Special. So Mr. Battery's going to drop in here like this. I didn't show the extraction earlier because I didn't know I was going to have to replace battery parts. By the way, calling it out now, um, they give you two spare fuses. This is a fuse holder. Um, so if you wonder what these are for, these are spares. The actual fuse is under here, so it is current protected. I take the hold down, which has a nice spot for the two extra fuses, which I find hilarious because you'd still have to get this cover off. Oh, they put screws on top, I guess, so okay. You could undo the two screws and then get this cover off and get to your fuse. So they did make it where you don't take the whole battery out, but it's not like it's that hard anyway. So, um, by the way, as design flaws on this go, they have screws to attach the seat, right? And that makes a lot of sense, but then you have to undo the seat to charge it. Well, how often do you have to charge it, you ask? Uh, <laughs> try every 30 minutes the kid gets it out and uses it. And it's a six-hour charge cycle. That means every time you get this out for your kid, you've got to pull the damned seat off and reattach the seat. So what do we end up doing? Same thing as every other parent in our position, probably. We leave the screws to attach the seat down there, and we just shove the seat in the plastic. But I'm sure some Consumer Product Safety Commission requirement mandates that they screw down the seat as some sort of obscure technical rule regarding child safety. Our no, kid's fine. So, all right, here we go. And um, let's plug up the battery. Let's see if we can hear a little bit of funny child car noises. It has a little fake motor circuit. Oh, come on. It does not something I can do. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to get a laugh out of you as well. Now, this switch is a double pull, double throw. You notice the corner missing on the chunks because I opened it with a knife. So despite the fact it's a DPDT, um, it only uses one side for the kid, uh, for the power wheels thing. The, the other side is completely unused, so she had burned out the contacts on one of these from driving it and turning it off because that was fun. So I imagine the arcs had destroyed one side of contacts. So flip the leads to the other side. Now it makes the type of car noises, the little headlights work. So that battery is definitely happily charged, like we confirmed earlier by checking voltage. I'm going to need both hands. There we go. Plugging the battery charger now up on the wall. And as you can see, it's red and charging. So there you go. Congratulations, you've replaced the battery in your kids' power wheels. So hope you guys enjoy the video. It did come off. I just had to scoot it. Sorry. End of video, but I knew you had to see that.